friends, welcome to this session titled Self-Directed Play-Based Education for a Rich and Fulfilling Life. In the past, when most people considered transitioning out of conventional schooling into homeschooling, we often imagine nerdy little children sheltered at home doing academic workbooks at the kitchen table. But in reality, there's a growing movement of interesting, fascinating, fun, diverse educational options from forest schools to nature school to play-based learning, project-based learning, Waldorf-style holistic education, and the increasingly popular approach known as self-directed, interest-led education, also sometimes called unschooling. For many of us who grew up in a conventional school system with strict academics, the idea of free range, self-directed learning can seem too free, too daunting at first. We may be thinking, well, if I let my kids just have fun and do whatever they want, will they actually ever learn to read, learn to do math? Will they be able to get into university? Will they be able to get a job or start a career? What will their future hold if I do not pressure them to study and succeed in academics? To explore all of this with us, my guest today is the legendary author and researcher, Dr. Peter Gray. Dr. Gray is the author of one of the most popular books in the alternative education movement called Free to Learn, as well as the widely used college textbook, Psychology, which is now in his eighth edition. He's a research professor at Boston College who has conducted and published research in mammalian motivational mechanisms, neuroendocrinology, developmental evolutionary and educational psychology, anthropology, and children's natural ways of learning, and the lifelong value of play, especially mixed age play. He did his undergrad at Columbia University and earned a PhD in biological sciences at Rockefeller University. His current research and writing focuses primarily on children's natural ways of learning and the lifelong value of play. There's so much we can learn from Dr. Gray, so please help me in welcoming the founder of Alliance for Self-Directed Education, the author of Free to Learn, the legendary Dr. Peter Gray. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Thank Gray. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm very flattered by that introduction. <laughs> It's, it's such an honor to chat with you. Reading your book was one of the big, uh, they call them gateway drugs. You know, it was like a gateway for me to open to all these beautiful new possibilities. So I feel a very deeply honored to meet with you today and just to thank you directly for the wonderful influence that you've had on myself, my family and our community here. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for inviting me into this uh, discussion. For our audience, many of us have already read your book, but for those of us that are new to your work, could you give us a little backstory of how you became this pioneer in this movement? Tell us a little bit of the backstory. Uh, well, I, I really began to um, get involved in this uh, many years ago when my own son was rebelling in public school. He had fought with the school system from kindergarten through fourth grade. and um, he felt like it was a prison to him. He felt like he was being treated completely disrespectfully. He felt like the assignments that he was made to do at school were silly and that there were much more interesting things he could be doing. And so his mother and I were constantly being called into the, into the conferences with the teachers. What are we going to do with this rebellious kid? And it finally, people can read it in the book. I won't go through the, detail, the dramatic details of exactly how this happened. But the ultimate end of this was that he convinced us absolutely, his mother and I, that he, that he wasn't going to go on with school. He's going to continue to rebel. Uh, he he uh, simply was not going to put up with it. And uh, so what were we going to do? We, we looked at various uh, progressive schools. Um, we wouldn't have been able to afford them if we had to pay the full tuition, but it looked like he could get some scholarships. So that became a possibility. But when he visited those schools, he said, you know, this is still a prison. It's just, uh, 
It's just that they use a different vocabulary and it's a little bit nicer prison, but it's still a prison and I'm not going to go there. Wow. And uh, then we visited this very radically alternative school called the Sudbury Valley School, which was not, it was only a couple of miles from our home. Which at that time, this was back in the late 1970s, at that time, two miles was easy walking distance for a 10-year-old boy. Today, a uh, few people would have their 10-year-olds walk that far uh, on themselves to school, but that easy easy walking distance then. And um, so he, he, we visited that school and my son, who at that time was nine when we first visited, said, this is what I, if this is true, if what I'm seeing here is uh, not an illusion, this is what I want. This is what school should be. And basically what the Sudbury Valley School was then and still is today is a setting where Children and teenagers are not segregated from one another. There are kids there from age four on through high school age, uh, but they're not separated into different rooms. There's no courses that are, not only are there no required courses, there are not even any courses offered. Although if some child wants a tutorial or a course or a group of children say, we'd like to have a course in something, they can usually convince a staff member to help them with that. But courses are, most students, in fact, my son throughout his time there never took a course, never did a course. What you're doing is you're playing, you're exploring, you're following your own interests, you're interacting with a lot of interesting people about a lot of interesting things, you're getting involved in various kinds of hobbies. And this is what my son thought uh, an educational setting should be. And I was open to it. But I, like most parents who grew up in conventional schools, I had some concerns. One of my concerns was, you know, if he goes to this strange school, he's not getting any grades, he's not taking any tests, he's not doing any of the school-like things, is this going to limit his life in some way once he finishes here? I'm happy that he's happy here. He seems to be his mind is going all the time. He seems to be developing very well, but is this going to limit his life in some way? So for example, suppose he chooses some kind of a career that requires that he goes on to higher education. Can he get into a college from without doing any of these things that supposedly have to do in order to get into a college? Um, do all the graduates become artists or musicians, you know, living in their parents' basements because they can't find a way to make a living? You know, these things entered my mind. Um, I was, as I said, I was open to it, but um, I was concerned. And so to address my concern, I began asking about the graduates of the school. And I heard various stories about this graduate going on to do this and that. And I even met a few of the graduates. But then I decided, well, being a scientist, I need something more than just anecdotes, just a few stories. So let me do a systematic study of the graduates of the school. At that time, there were already uh, about close to 90 people that could be considered to be graduates of the school who had been there for at least their final two or three years of their education, and some of whom had been there for all of their primary and secondary education, had never gone to another school. And so uh, with the help of David Chanoff, who at that time was a, a part-time staff member at the school, I located essentially all of the graduates of the school and the great majority of them, something like 90% of them, uh, responded to a very long survey uh, about their memories of being at the school, about what they were doing now, about uh, all kinds of questions of what they did at the school, what their what relationship that might have to what they're doing today. And what I found was uh, really allayed my concerns as a parent, the graduates of school, those who wanted to go on to higher education. Amazingly, this was the most surprising thing to me, didn't have any problem doing it. You know, we hear, we all believe in our culture, most of us believe, that I used to believe that um, if you didn't do all those, go through all those hoops you're supposed to go through, if you want to go to college, you, they would never let you in. Or if they let you in, you could never do well there because you haven't prepared yourself, you haven't done all the testing and so on and so forth. But here's kids who had never done any school. Basically, school as we think of it, had never done any school. Went on to college, did fine, got in, <laughs> including to some very selective colleges. Uh, some went to community colleges, which basically anybody can go to, and then they went from there to four-year colleges. But some went directly to even quite selective four-year colleges if they wanted to do that. 
but uh, not all of them went to college, only those who had some reason for going to college because of maybe a job that, that they're interested in depends upon college, or maybe they really were interested in a liberal arts education, truly interested, and they wanted that. But everybody, you know, people who've been, ed who've educated themselves in this kind of a system don't feel like they have to go to college to have a good life. They don't feel like they have to go to college to learn They've been learning all their life without any coercion or formal instruction. Uh, and so many people who, people who started their own businesses or who got various kinds of jobs, who became craftspeople or who, uh, who, who were entrepreneurs and um, some of them were artists and musicians, good enough actually that they were making a living, not living in their parents' basement. Uh, and. Um, so, and they had gone on in the whole range of careers uh, that we admire in our society. So I was uh, relieved as a parent, but I was also uh, intrigued as an academic. And so I began to wonder, well, how are people getting, clearly by any reasonable definition of education, the graduates of this school are educated. They're going on to good adult life. Um, I define education as uh, everything that you learn that enables you to live a satisfying and meaningful life. And these people were living satisfying and meaningful lives. And so by that definition, they were educated. And uh, then the question is, how did they become educated? You, you know, they are, quote, just playing, hanging out, exploring, doing the, doing the things you would expect kids to do if they're free to do what they want to do. And yet they're becoming educated. And so that became the question that I have been pursuing in some sense ever since in, in various kinds of ways. How do children become educated when we don't force them through some kind of a curriculum, when we allow them to pursue their own interests? Wow. Well, we are all so grateful to your son. And actually, I'm grateful to my son, who even at preschool age started speaking about this, like in, in a four-year-old kind of way. He's, he would say, Mama, I don't like it. That why do I eat snacks when they say snack time? I want to eat snacks when my body says hungry, not yes. when teacher says snack time. And I want to pee pee and poo poo when my body says pee pee and poo poo, <laughs> not when they say potty break. He's now... Yeah almost eight years old and he's thriving as an unschooler. So the whole thing is like mm -hmm. our children, we have so much to be grateful for with our children, really like mm -hmm. helping us to break these old molds and think fresh, think new about these new possibilities. So you've definitely intrigued us. So how does learning occur without coercion? So I, um, from my own research, from bringing together other people's research, I have uh, developed what I call a biological theory of self-directed education. I'm convinced that children come into the world biologically designed to educate themselves. The reason that they come into the world with that design is because throughout most of human history, there was no such thing as school. There was no, there was no concept that children needed to be educated by adults in any deliberate fashion. Throughout most of human history, children just grew up and they learned what they needed to know by interacting with the world around them. So uh, one of the approaches I took in my research uh, some years ago, it's now about 20 years ago actually, was to survey anthropologists who had studied uh, hunter-gatherer bands. There are really no pure hunter-gatherer groups today. They're all kind of influenced in one way or another by modern culture. There are some that are still in some ways living a hunter-gatherer way of life. But as late as the uh, even, even late 20th century, certain, certainly mid-20th to mid 20th century on to about 1980 or 1990, it was still possible for anthropologists to trek out into various uh, parts of the world, isolated parts of the world, and find people who were living a rather pristine hunter-gatherer way of life, very little influenced by uh, what we think of as modern culture, modern society, modern system, modern ways of living. 
presumably living in the way that people would have lived over 10,000 years ago prior to the advent of agriculture. They're living by, they're living by foraging in nature. And these are all uh, hunter, what are called band hunter gatherers, which are presumed by mo many, if not most anthropologists to be the predominant way that human beings lived throughout much of uh, prehistory, much of the time before agriculture. And uh, what I learned from that survey and from reading everything I could find about children in hunter-gatherer cultures as well, is that in every one of these cultures that has been studied, um, the children are free to play and explore essentially all day long. Basically, the philosophy of education is the same philosophy as what it was existing at Sudbury Valley School. Children will learn what they need to learn. If you give them ample time and opportunity to do so, you don't need to teach them, you don't need to course them, you don't need to, and so on and so forth. So in these cultures, children are playing in age-mixed groups. They're often playing away from adults, but they're also interacting with the adults. They're sometimes interfering with the adults, with what the adults are doing, and the adults let them do that because they figure this is how the children learn. Children want to take part in some of the adult activities. They even, even if they're somewhat in hindering what the adults are doing, the adults let them do it because they understand this is how children learn. So, the, so the adult role in that culture is to is to uh, support the child's own needs and interests and desires rather than to try to suppress them and to uh, channel them in some other direction. So. Um, so this is the way that children were educated throughout time, <laughs> presumably, is through their own activities, through pursuing their own interests. And so, um, so then, so, so then, so, so it began to make sense that children would be born over the course of hundreds of thousands of years, uh, those children who had systems within their brains that promote self-education, self-directed education, those children would be more likely to survive and do well and leave offspring. This is natural, this is how natural selection works than children who didn't have that. And so after hundreds of thousands of years of such evolution, we've got children being born today, all of whom essentially have these drives in their brains. Now, what are these drives? And in some sense, it's, it's obvious. Um, one of them is curiosity. You know, children are curious. What you know, the, they're they're so curious that we can't stop them from exploring the world around them. It's why we have to baby-proof our house. They want to get into everything, not because they're naughty, but because they want to they want to understand everything. What would happen if I stuck a bobby pin in this electric outlet? What would happen if I drop this glass plate down on the floor? Ooh, <laughs> you know, what would happen if I did this or that? They're just, they want to know, they want to know what everything is there. They want to know what the properties of everything are. They want to know what, most of all, they want to know what they can do with things. They want to know what, are, what, what potential does this have for my doing something with it? So they're constantly manipulating their environment. We can't stop them from learning about their environment and exploring unless we lock them away in a closet. They're just always exploring. So curiosity is, uh, is a fundamental educative drive. They're curious also about people. What, do other, what are other people doing and what do they know? And they overhear what people are talking about and they want to get involved in what, uh, what uh, people of various ages are doing so that they can learn from them. The second, uh, the second educative drive is playfulness. So there's, if you think about it, there's sort of two aspects of education that no matter, no matter how you think about education, whether you're thinking about it in terms of conventional schooling or you're thinking about it in the ways that I'm talking about now, there are two aspects to education. One is the acquisition of knowledge and information knowledge about the world, knowledge about things, what, what, what are, what's out there, what are the names of things, what can you do with various things, and so on. This is part of education. And the other thing is skills, being able to do things. <laughs> so acquiring information and acquiring skills. Curiosity is the drive to acquire information. Play is the drive to acquire skills. 
play is how children practice skills. And in fact, you know, even, even before anybody began to think about this in very deeply in terms of human children, animal behaviorists were already pointing out that other mammals play and when they're young and what are they doing when they're playing? They're practicing the skills that they need in order to become ultimately independent adults. So predatory animals are practicing at predation. They're practicing, they're at chasing one another and leaping and pouncing and they give play bites to their litter mates and so on. They, they, they pretend they're preying upon one another. Prey animals for whom their life, the main constraint to their life is staying away from predators. <laughs> they play at dodging and darting and getting away. Uh, so, so their chase games are common among all young mammals and for predatory animals, the preferred position is to be the chaser. For prey animals, the preferred position is to be the one being chased, practicing getting away. Uh, but you, I could go on and on with, with other animals. What you know, you could pretty much predict what an animal will play at by knowing what it is that that animal has to learn in order to be able to survive and thrive as the species that it is. Well, human children, if you look at children in hunter-gatherer cultures and in other cultures where children are much more free than in our culture, play more than, um, than any other animal does and they play in more different ways. And it's not surprising given that we humans have more different things that we have to learn. And so if play is the foundation for acquiring skills, it's no surprise that human children would play a great deal and they would play at the various kinds of skills that are uniquely important to human beings. So if you think about it, what are the skills that we human beings have to learn? We have to learn our native language. Well, all children, unless they've got some serious brain damage, learn their native language. Nobody teaches them their native language. Nobody teaches the child how to speak. The child learns it by being immersed in the language, by hearing it, by paying attention to it, by practicing it. Children's initial language um, production is entirely play. The first cooing and babbling is always playful. The child is happy and playing with these sounds. When the child, the child's first words are never used instrumentally to ask for anything. They're used playfully. They're just playfully pointing things out, just kind of playing with the idea that this thing has a name and this is the name of it. Uh, so children are acquiring language. So children have a desire, an innate drive to play with language and that's how they learn language. We are also the animal that builds things. We've got opposable thumbs because we're the animal that has always built our environment in various ways. We build shelters to live in, we build tools for hunting, tools for other purposes, we build means of conveyances and so on and so forth. And so children all over the world, when they have ample opportunity to play, play at building things. This is called constructive play. We are the animal that's capable of imagination. We can think of things that aren't actually present. We consider this to be the highest form of human thought, the ability to imagine things that aren't there and to think logically about them. This is why we can be inventors. This is why we can be theoretical scientists. This is even why we can think about tomorrow, which never happens yet. But we can imagine tomorrow and think about what might happen tomorrow and prepare for it because of that. So this ability to use imagination, as far as we know, we're the only animal capable really of imagination. And it's no surprise therefore that children play all the time at imagination. They're imagining scenes. They're imagining that they're somebody that they aren't. They're imagining, they're, you, can, you can picture children playing, imagine that there's a, that there's a troll under the bridge here, the bridge being the dining room table. And you know, well, if there's a troll under the bridge, we better not go under the bridge uh, or we better bring some cookie to the troll so he eats that instead of us. So the children are um, engaged in imaginative, hypothetical reasoning in their play. Even little three and four-year-olds are doing this all the time. 
we are also the animal that has to follow rules. You know, the uh, no matter what society you live in, you can't just do whatever you want to do. You've got to behave in accordance with the social norms and the rules of the society that you're growing up with. You might bend them a little bit, but you've got to kind of stay within them or you will be rejected from that society. So we couldn't live in a human society if we weren't, if we didn't, have the concept that there are certain things that we have to do to live in society, certain things we cannot do. We can't just behave in accordance with our whims and, and selfish wishes. We have to conform to society. So children all over the world play games that involve rules and they're learning to use rules. They're even creating rules in their games. In fact, I've argued that all play in some sense involves rules. There are certain guidelines within any kind of play about what you're do doing. And to stay within those guidelines requires conscious attention and the ability to control your behavior in accordance with the rules of this game. So children are practicing following rules and creating rules and enforcing rules in, in their play. We are, among other things, a social animal. We have got to be able to get along with other people. That may be the most important thing we have to learn in order to live a, a satisfying and, and, uh, and happy life and, and productive life. We can't, we're, we can't survive alone. We have to get along with other people. We certainly have to get along with at least one other person if we're gonna have offspring, right? I mean, we've gotta, we've gotta connect with other people. We've gotta know how to, how to deal with other people. We can't do well in our work if we can't get along with workmates. We're very unhappy. We're not supported in life if we don't have real friends. All of this depends upon social skills. Well, how do children acquire social skills? By playing socially. Children, no matter how else they're playing, they want to, most of all to play with other children away from adults. And the reason is because that's how they practice getting along with their peers, getting along with other children without some authority figure having to step in and solve the problems. They're learning how to negotiate, how to deal with the fact that not everybody is nice to you all the time that how what are you going to do about that how do you how do you how, how do you resolve these kinds of conflicts that you have with other children you have this strong drive to play with other children but sometimes that gets challenged and then the question is how do you meet that challenge so children are learning that and they're learning social skills in that process on top of all of this, of course, children are also practicing what all mammals practice in play, which is physical, just simple physical movement, physical ability to run, to climb, to jump, the development of the body. This is, children are not designed to lift weights or operate machines, in a, exercise machines, or to swim back and forth in a pool. They're designed to, to chase one another around until their sides are splitting, to climb trees, to do all these. This is how children get in shape. This is how children learn to move gracefully. It's how the children develop solid muscles, good heart and lung, and so on and so forth. So the point I'm making is this whole range of human skills from physical to social to intellectual to emotional, how to control your emotions when you're angry at somebody or when you're a, f a little bit frightened because you're playing in some way that's inducing some fear. All of these things children are, are learning in play. And of course, if we, if we don't allow children, they don't have ample opportunity to learn these things in play. So curiosity and play are the two drives that I most often talk about when I talk about the drives, the educative drives. But let me just quickly mention three others that I also talk about. One is sociability. So I've talked about the fact that children want to play socially because we're such social animals. But in addition, our, our desire to connect with one another is in part related to our desire to learn from one another. So one of the, the reason language evolved is because we can use language to learn from one another. Right now, you know, we're involved in a conversation. We're using language and we're learning from one another through conversation. Every day in a less formal way, we're involved in conversations. We're learning, you know, the neighborhood gossip, whatever it is, we're acquiring information that is useful to us in one way or another. And we, we go out and we see there's some danger out there in the woods and we come back and we tell other people, well, there's that 
danger out there in the woods. There's a bear, the mother bear and her cubs out there. I'd avoid that area if I were you. So we are, we use language to teach one another all the time, just in normal everyday life. This is not formal teaching. This is just part of normal life. And children do the same thing. They tell one another about things and they want to hear about things uh, that are real in the real world around them that are important. And sometimes they want to hear about other things that are just stories and interesting to them. So sociability, the, the desire to learn from other people and to share information with other people in the course of everyday life is part of the educative drive. And then uh, an additional part of the educative drive is simply the drive to grow up. Children are very aware that they're, that they're not going to be children all their lives and they don't wanna be children all their lives. They wanna be grownups. When they, when they play fantasy games, they don't play that they're children. You know, that's the last, you don't wanna be the baby. You wanna be the mama or the daddy or the, or the superhero. You know, if you have to be the baby, you'll be the baby, but then next time you wanna be the daddy or the mama or, you know, you know the, the children wanna play adult roles. They wanna do adult-like things. They are very aware that they're on a trajectory to grow up and they wanna grow up and they wanna grow up well. You know, Peter Pan, the boy who didn't wanna grow up, that's an adult fantasy. That's not a child's fantasy. <laughs> you know, there may be some adults that say, oh, I wish I'd never grew up. But there's, an, I have yet to meet a child who doesn't wanna grow up. They all wanna grow up. <laughs> and so this desire to grow up and to grow up well. So they're they're aware of growing up. They're aware that at some point they're going to have to make their own living. They're going to have, and so, and so this leads to another uh, aspect of uh, of human nature that I think serves the function of education. And this is what I call planfulness. Um, planfulness is not actually an English word. My spell check always keeps telling me. But the uh, but I uh, but of course it's obvious what it means. It's the ability to plan, to make plans, and um, I think that children are practicing making plans uh, as soon as children are playing. By the time they're two years old and begin to play, they're already making a plan because play requires a plan. You say, "I'm playing at this," and that me, and then you're carrying that out. You've made a little plan. I'm going to make a I'm going to make a sandcastle. That's a plan, right? And then you're actually making that sandcastle. And as children get older, they begin to plan farther and farther ahead. They're exercising their ability to plan and to follow through. So maybe two children are making a sandcastle and they, uh, they have to go in for, for lunch and they say, well, after lunch, let's come back and continue making this sandcastle. So that's making a plan in the future, not too far in the future, but somewhat in the future. They may or may not remember that plan, but they may remember it. And as they get older, they get better at making plans farther and farther ahead if they've had lots of opportunity to make plans because other people aren't doing the planning for them. They're allowed to make their own plans. They get better at making plans, following through on their plans. By the time they become teenagers, they may be thinking about the fact, this desire to grow up plus planfulness, they may be thinking about the fact that well, I'm not going to be dependent on my parents my whole life. I don't want to live in my parents' basement. <laughs> I'm going to have to make a living some way. How might I make that living? And then they begin to think about, well, of all the thing, ways of making a living and given what I'm interested in, and by that time they have a pretty good sense of what they're interested in, and what I'm, might I make a living at and how do I have to prepare myself to make that living? They're beginning to make a plan sort of for the future. And this comes as a result of having had lots of experience thinking in shorter term ways about their future and making plans. Um, so those are kind of, these are the things that I most often talk about when I talk about the biological foundations for education. The fact that children, come into the world with all of these drives. Now, the thing that I wanna point out, these are the fundamental biological drives that promote education. These are children's natural ways of learning, but all of them are suppressed in school. <laughs> so curiosity is suppressed. You can't have a class of 20 or 30 kids 
and allow curiosity to be the motivating force because there's no way that all those kids are going to be curious about the same things at the same time. And the one thing that our school system doesn't allow is chaos <laughs> in the classroom. If every child was doing what they wanted to do, you would have chaos. You would, and you could have a school that way, but it would be nothing like the kinds of schools that are public school. You would have a Sudbury Valley kind of school <laughs> where chaos is to be expected, but it's controlled chaos because there are certain rules that prevent people from, from interfering with, other, with, with one another. So, so, you, so curiosity is disruptive in school. It's suppressed. The child, is being, the child who's being taught one thing is curious about another thing, but the child is scolded for that curiosity because the child is now trying to figure out something, doing something that, that has nothing to do with the lesson at hand, and that's disruptive to the classroom. You're, you're um, giving all of our audience flashbacks to our childhood right now. I'm like having all these images of, of elementary school. So curious. Oh, oh, what about this? What about this? Sit down, shut up. You know, you're in right. And don't talk out of turn. And it's like, oh, wow. I mean, there's like there is um, excitement as I'm listening to you talk about all of this, but also a lot of grief inside about how many of us like right. our childhood, how how it could have been different. Exactly. So curiosity has to be suppressed. Play, if it occurs at all at school, is considered a break from learning. It's not the vehicle for learning. It's recess. It's a break from learning. There, there at least used to be acknowledgement that children needed these breaks to go outdoors and play. Now recess is greatly reduced and even is absent in some schools today. But uh, but recess is not considered to be part of the educational uh, aspect. And recess also is not a very good play environment in, in most schools because there's such limited space. There's limitations of who you're playing with. Everybody's the same age. You're in this control space and there are all kinds of rules and probably a teacher telling you you can't do this and you can't do that. And so it's not even real play, uh, but certainly play within the classroom is disruptive uh, unless it's unless it's kind of what some teachers call play, which is playful learning, where they've set up some kind of game-like way of teaching a lesson. But that's not real play because it's not self-chosen by the by the child. So uh, so these and sociability, you know, talking, sharing, sharing your answers. <laughs> You know, that's cheating in school, right? I mean, it's all supposed to be individual. You're supposed to be, um, if you help another person on the test, that's cheating, both for the other person and for you. Uh, so the child's desire to help one, other children, to be sociable, to socially connect, to share information, that's suppressed in school. Planfulness doesn't get exercised very much because of the fact that plans are all made for you. The desire you're told what you're going to do at every hour, every minute in school. You're told what you have to prepare for the next day. You don't have to figure any of that out. You're not, you're not engaging in any meaningful planfulness. There's very limited social. People talk about, people worry that homeschoolers aren't going to get socialized and kids get socialized in school. But what socialization really is occurring in school? Some, I would admit, but to a large extent, there's real limitations on the way kids can interact with one another in school. Uh, they can't just really spontaneously play and talk and laugh and connect and argue and tease one another and do all the things that children naturally do when they are naturally with one another. So it's a very, and they're all the same age. And this is a very, so this is all a very artificial kind of social interaction that's occurring in school. So isn't it interesting? So we take, you know, we, we have these institutions that we regard as institutions for education and we suppress all of children's natural ways of educating themselves in those institutions. And then we use reward and punishment as the way of trying to get them to learn what we think is important for them to learn. What an inefficient way to go about education. <laughs> wow. Please tell us a little bit more about rewards and punishment. What, how does that distort our learning and education? 
Yeah, well, I mean, children naturally want to want to explore the world. They naturally want to play. This is all joyful. This is all, I shouldn't say it's always joyful in the sense that everybody's smiling and laughing all the time. It can be also very intense. It can even be a little bit scary, but it's all self, it's all immersion, the child immersing themselves in the world around them as they are learning. But the point is, in self-directed education, you have to trust the child, that you have to trust that the child is going to learn what the child needs to know in order to do well in the world. Our school system is not founded on that kind of trust. It's founded on a belief that there are certain things that, the, that every child has to learn <laughs> at a certain age in a certain way if they're going to do well in the world. I'm not sure that anybody actually believes this but the school system is founded as it operates as if we believe this <laughs> the school system operates in that way and to defend the school system you have to argue that there are these certain things that are really important to learn and they have to be learned in a certain time in a certain order or people aren't going to learn them properly well if you're going to do that there's no way around using reward and punishment <laughs> People are simply not, it's not, every child is not ready or interested in, for example, learning how to read when they're five or six years old or even seven years old. Not every child is interested in learning about, you know, the wars in Western Europe when they're 12 years old, or that not every child is ever interested in learning how to solve quadratic equations. But if you believe that, Every child has to learn these things in a certain time. The only way you're going to get them to do it is to, in one way or another, force them to do it. When schools of the kind we have today first started, the way you motivated children to learn was by beating them, literally beating them if they didn't. The early schools, the early Protestant-run schools, which are the forerunners of the schools we have today, the primary motivator was the birch stick. <laughs> You didn't learn your lessons, you got beaten. <laughs> now, there are records that schoolmasters, as they were called in those days, kept records that showed how much educating they did that day by how many times they beat a child for not reciting their lessons back. Well, we've come to believe that physically beating a child is abusive. So we don't do that in schools today. In most states in the United States, it's illegal, although it's still legal, believe it or not, in some states and still does occur at least some kind of for corporal punishment still does occur to some degree but largely we find that repugnant today but so we use a different kind of punishment which in my mind is every bit as harmful as beating a child and that is shaming the child that is constantly comparing that child to other children we don't necessarily do it in an overt way but we do it in a way that's obvious to that child you failed this test. You got the worst mark in the class. You only got a B minus and so-and-so got an A plus. <laughs> you, know? you are not going to be the valedictorian. For different people who buy into this system feel shamed at different levels of all of this, but we're constantly, we're constantly comparing every child to every other child. Are you behind or are you ahead or are you on track? Are you, are you going to pass or are you going to fail? Did you do your lessons today or did you do your not? You're a failure if you didn't, if you didn't, if you didn't succeed in doing this thing that you are being required to do. So we use psychological punishments instead of physical punishments. One of the effects of this, I, you know, I did a, a blog post a few years ago in which I asked people about their regular dreams. Uh, and people of middle age and even older than middle age talk about regularly dreaming about school, <laughs> regularly having these nightmares about school, about failing a test, about going to a test and they're not prepared for it, about not being able to find the classroom, about hearing that they didn't pass and they have to repeat this and that. Even people who've gone on to very successful lives, they're still having these nightmares. You know, we have this is we are incorporating we are we are we are shaming children we are we are developing this consistent anxiety and fear 
that has lifelong consequences in many aspects of people's lives and it even shows up in people's dreams as they go through life. Oh, you've given us a lot to think about. The question that often pops up though, do the parents and educators, what is their role then? Because there is an important role that we do want to play that is more like a facilitator, a creator of a supportive, resource-filled, rich experience of life. Can you talk with us a little bit about how we step into this role that supports this new paradigm of education? Well, let, me, let me start with parents. So the, the, um, the parents' fundamental task, of course, which is usually not one that's difficult for parents, is to love the child. Parents naturally love their child. <laughs> you have to love your child, but you also have to respect your child. And unfortunately, there are a lot of parents who love their child, but don't respect their child in the sense of recognize that that child is a unique human being. That child is not you. That child is not a reflection of you. That child is not your product. That child is not uh, your toy. <laughs> that child is a separate person who you love, but you don't necessarily know. <laughs> this is a child who has entered your house. This is a human being who's entered your house. And your job, first of all, because the child starts off pretty much helpless, you have to help that child survive. You have to feed the child. You have to comfort the child. You have to clothe the child, shelter the child, protect it from serious dangers. But you also have to let that child grow. And you have to let that child grow in the ways that the child wants to grow to the degree that you possibly can. That's part of respecting this child as an individual. That your, your own dream for what, that's your dream. You have to separate that. You know, you might have a dream of uh, becoming a doctor. Then you should become a doctor. <laughs> Don't think that it's your job to make your child become a doctor. <laughs> you know, Don't make it, you know, your child has to figure out who he or she is, has to find their way. Your job is to support the child in that endeavor, provide the conditions that allow the child to explore, that allow the child to play, allow the child to connect with parts of the world that the child wants to connect with provide the conditions that allow that child to grow. Among other things, one of the biggest challenges in today's world, it didn't used to be a challenge, but it's a big challenge in today's world, is how do you provide that child with um, other children to play with, <laughs> to really play with, not like a play date, <laughs> but the kind of play that children all over the world have always engaged in, away from adults, with other children, preferably age mixed play, regular play, have all kinds of adventures together and so on. That's a hugely important part of growing up. It used to be easy in the United States and in many other con Western countries to do this because you just sent the kid outdoors. Everybody sent their kid outdoors and there are always plenty of kids to play with. But for the last several decades, uh, nobody's sending their kids outdoors for a variety of reasons. And so it's harder and harder to find, for kids to find playmates, real playmates, and to really play. They're the old fashioned neighborhood play and the kind of play where you, a whole bunch of kids would run off to the dump or go off into the forest and play together or whatever, wherever they went to play. Uh, that doesn't occur today because we're so afraid that some danger is going to occur to them. Um, and there are various other reasons why this has changed. So I think one of the big challenges for parents is how do you provide a network of children. How do you how do you work with other families to provide a network of children that, so that your child has real playmates? That's important. So I think they, these are some of the things that parents have to do. If you are a facilitator in a like a Sudbury school, I think it's a little bit different there. The, some of these things are automatically taken care of at a Sudbury school. There's a lot of other kids to play with. There's uh, there's, uh, there's at Sudbury Valley itself, there's a big play area, there's a forest, there's a pond, there's all kinds of outdoor interesting things to do. And there's a whole range of kids and there's always kids to play with and interact with and do things with. 
Um, but I think that as an adult, you are still in some sense, there's a certain responsibility you have to be sure that kids are safe enough. We've gone too far in the direction of safety <laughs> as a society where we think we're protecting children by not allowing them to go out and play in the park with other kids without an adult there or not allowing them to walk and do errands at the local store and so on because we think they'll be snatched away by a stranger or that there's danger of traffic and so on and so forth. Kids have always dealt with these things in the past and they're perfectly competent to deal with these things if they have the experience and we teach them safety measures and so on and so forth. But in today's world, we're too much protecting children from that and they're not learning how to deal with, they're not learning street smarts. They're not learning how to deal with the real world. So I think it's adults' responsibility, whether it's parents or, or facilitators at the school to, to help teach children safety measures, how to, how, how to cross the street. Don't forbid them from crossing the street, but teach them how to cross the street. Don't forbid them from using the internet, but teach them safety rules about the internet. Don't get sucked into giving money to somebody who wants money. Don't send naked pictures of yourself to anybody on the internet. Don't do that. You know, these are safety rules. These are, you know, don't put anything on the internet that you wouldn't want a future employer to see, right? because they will search. <laughs> so there, there are safety rules that we need to teach our children and that's an adult responsibility. Instead of, instead of preventing our children from interacting in the world, we need to teach them safety rules for how to interact in the world safely. Um, so that's, a, that's part of an adult role. Thank you for that. This is our second baby that just- Oh, <laughs> hi. <laughs> Hello, this is Dr. Peter Gray. I have heard you speak some really interesting nuance of perspectives about Waldorf and Montessori in other interviews, because our audience, I think we're open to many different perspectives and we're trying to integrate. How can we bring the best of all these different traditions? Can you share a little bit your perspective about Waldorf and your perspective about Montessori? Yeah, you know, there's certainly much to be admired about both and for people who can afford them because they tend to be expensive uh, and they also tend to be just the early grades rather than uh, throughout what we think of as secondary education as well as primary education. But, um, but given that, there's still much to be said for them, but I think that um, there are limitations. So for example, Mont first of all, Montessori schools vary tremendously from school to school. I've talked with people in different Montessori schools and some of them are, I think Maria Montessori would be rolling over in her grave if she knew what was going on <laughs> in such schools under her name. I also, uh, as much as I admire Montessori's writing, I disagree with her very much on one aspect. In her schools, her schools were primarily initially for kids who had um, psychological problems of certain sorts, learning disorders of certain, what we would call today learning disorders of certain sorts. And so she emphasized uh, play of a certain type that she felt would help these kids. And she, down, she, she discouraged fantasy play. She sh discouraged imaginative play because she believed that these children were too much in a fantasy world. And she encouraged constructive play with blocks and there are all these Montessori toys that are designed for learning certain kinds of lessons. And so the play was not necessarily free play. It was play that was kind of constrained. And in my mind, that's really not play. And, and children are not learning everything they need to learn in play. There are many Montessori schools that don't follow that part of Montessori. A lot of fantasy play going on among the kids at the school. So that's fine. But I think that, I think that, that, that nevertheless, whether it's a Montessori school or whether it's any other progressive type of school, the difference between that and self-directed education is there's still the sense that the teacher or the facilitator is responsible for the child's learning and that there is something failing, there's something not right if the child is not learning what the child would be expected to be learning at this time. So maybe they're more liberal about when you should be learning to read, but they all believe you should be learning to read by a certain age. 
Um, whereas in self-directed education, we know there are some kids who just don't get interested in learning to read until they're maybe 9, 10, 11 years old, and then they learn how to read very quickly whenever they get interested. And that's just fine. They're doing all kinds of interesting things, learning in all kinds of different, all kinds of ways. The, um, the other thing about some of the, about some of the progressive education is they're a little bit stuck in time. So for example, um, Steiner education uh, tends to uh, be opposed to, to technology, like uh, wooden toys, <laughs> you know, uh, like, you know, this is kind of, uh, this is kind of 1920s, <laughs> you know, the, uh, and it's a little bit stuck in that. The good thing they don't occur, they, they believe that it's fine to not to be able to read until you're seven or eight years old, but they even discourage reading earlier on. And what, but why discourage it if the child really is interested? So there's a kind of, you know, each of these systems has its own you know, the founders had certain views and those views kind of get carried on and they become in some sense restrictions. Um, like a dogma that gets stuck in time. So they're a little bit stuck in time. I, I, I once heard a talk, I was talking at a conference of sort of alternative education and there and one of the moms was give, giving a talk and her child had been, um, and they were really, um, they were really into the Steiner model of education. And so they didn't allow their child to have a computer uh, because this grand counter. <laughs> she started off by showing the whole family was wearing knit hats that they had made themselves and they had all these wooden toys and they were doing all the proper things. And then this child uh, had an awful bicycle accident in which he almost died. And he went into the hospital and there was very little he could do. He had to be in the, he had to be bedridden for a long period of time. And they took pity on him and they gave him what he had been begging for, which was a computer. <laughs> and the boy said, according to the mom, the boy said, it was worth it. <laughs> it was worth having this terrible bicycle accident in order to finally get a computer and join the modern age. I mean, that's my words, not Yes, but you know, so the uh, I think that any any kind of educational philosophy that limits what the child can do, that the child is interested in doing, that's limiting the child's self direction. That's limiting the child's direction. There are all kinds of parents who believe they're very enlightened parents, and because they're enlightened parents they're not allowing their child to use a computer or only allowing the child to use the computer a certain time of day, or they're only, they're doing this or that. The child can only eat, uh, only eat organic foods. The child, you know, you're kind of controlling the child <laughs> in accordance with your priorities, which may really be restricting the child's ability to develop and develop their own priorities, their own views, their own understanding of the world. I'm deeply grateful to Dana Martin who connected you and I together. She she really helped me to see how it's not that you don't want your child to eat organic. It's just that, well, respect them, have a conversation about it, and then let them choose. And actually right. without the coercion and the fear mongering and all this kind of rigidity, our children basically, they just trust us. Like when we right. share with them, hey, you know, here's the deal with organic and the pesticides. And, you know, they're like, oh, OK, of course, I'd prefer to eat organic. Right. No yeah, problem. I mean, I should, I, 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 I should hasten to add that I think it's fine for a family to say, you know, we're organic. We're going to eat organic food or we're vegetarian. We're not going to eat meat because we as a family don't believe in that. But your child, if your child sees that simply as a restriction and and doesn't buy into it, it is becomes a restriction. Your child is going to eat all kinds of terrible stuff when your back is turned, <laughs> anyway. And so you and you don't want to be having to monitor your child all the time and control your child. So you have to allow your child those kinds of freedoms. I think if you're if you are if you believe in self-directed childhood and self-directed education. But I agree. I agree. It's good to have conversations. Different families have different beliefs about these things. Uh, some founded on science, some founded on religion, some founded on 
just their own peculiar <laughs> their peculiar ideas about the world uh, and that's part of growing up is adapting to your family and you may or may not stick with that as you go beyond beyond your family but i think that one of the things that one has to worry about especially with homeschooling the downside of homeschooling is that if the child is growing up in a family that is not fully connected with the rest of the world and is restricting the child's connections to the rest of the world that child is getting a very narrow self-directed education and if the purpose of self-directed education if the purpose of homeschooling i should say is to prevent the child from trying this or trying that or learning about this or learning about that that's not good for the child. The child needs to explore the world. The child needs to learn about ideas that are different from their own parents' ideas. The child needs to learn about other ways of living. This is part of growing up. And all children want to do this, and at some point they will do this, but it's best if they can do it within the, the context of the loving family who is allowing them to explore these ideas and not narrowly restricting their uh, understanding. Homeschooling for some period of time had a very negative kind of connotation in the United States because it was primarily initially very uh, fundamental religious people who were homeschooling in order to prevent their child from learning the evil things <laughs> that were being taught in the public school. That's not a good reason for homeschooling. You've given us so many different aspects of this. This was a wonderful holistic tour. How can we follow more of your work? How to keep learning with you? Well, um, I I write a regular blog for Psychology Today. There's some there's something like 210 essays on that blog at this point. Uh, you can find that just by googling Peter Gray Psychology Today. Most of the essays are on are are, are research based. I summarize a lot of research on these, and they mostly have to do with education and play and curiosity and children's development. That's one way. People who want to read my academic articles, and they are readable. I I don't use very technical language in my academic articles. Uh, you can find PDFs of many of them on my on the author page of my Psychology Today blog. So if you go to my blog and click on my photo on any of the posts, you get to the author page, and in the left hand column there are PDFs of many of my research articles, published articles. I also you can follow me on Facebook. I, uh, on a regular basis, I recycle uh, earlier blog posts, uh, links to my blog posts, links to uh, articles that I think are relevant to these issues. Uh, and of course, you can look into the Alliance for Self-Directed Education, ASDE. Um, I have stepped down from the board of directors of ASDE, but I'm very supportive of it. And that's a place that there's a lot of information about self-directed education and support for people who are wish to go in that direction or are going in that direction. Wonderful. In all of this research, what was the most surprising result that you saw? It's no longer surprising to me, but at the time, the most surprising thing was when I did that study of the graduates of Sudbury Valley School, and I found that they had no difficulty going to college. That even surprised me, that they're getting into college. Most people in our culture, including me, believed that to get into college, you had to have a high school diploma, and you had to have taken certain courses. The colleges tell you this. <laughs> but it turns out they will accept you anyway. Uh, and I've come to believe that actually people who didn't go through the standard procedures, standard educational system, actually have an easier time getting into college, especially elite colleges. I might be wrong on this, but I've seen enough examples of it. And I think the reason is because they stand out as different. <laughs> they stand out as kind of unique. So. You know, imagine that you are on the admissions committee at Harvard or Stanford or any of those fancy schools like that, and you're going through the hundreds and hundreds of applicants. And, you know, applicants that got all A's uh, and are on the, always on the honors roll and 
we're uh, in all the honors courses and we're elected to the to the top positions in the school and so on they're all like that every one of them <laughs> you know uh, how boring and then here's some applicant who says well i didn't actually go to any real school i don't have any grades to share with you i <laughs> haven't actually taken any courses but i but, have a portfolio of but, actual successful projects and work to show but you but here are the projects some some of the projects i've done here are some of the poetry i've written here is some of the and here is why i want to go to your college and there's a real reason why I want to go to your college. Uh, you know, one of the one of the graduates of Sudbury Valley who went on to Brandeis University, which is a pretty selective college, she went there because she had been reading the uh, works of the chair of the department, uh, the economics department. She wanted to study under that person, <laughs> and so. She, as part of her application, she said, in order to be sure that I want to go here, I want to have a conversation with this person that I really uh, admire. So she met with the chair of the economics department. It was clear that she had read his work. She had interesting things to say about it. I'm absolutely sure that, I don't know if this was just a strategy to get in or, you know, it may have been, uh, but I'm sure that he immediately called over to the admissions office and said, this girl is brilliant. You've got to accept her. I mean, you know, what, uh, what professor isn't egocentric enough to believe that whoever's reading his work must be a brilliant young person. And you know, so, so people in self-directed education often First of all, they genuinely do have real interest. And if they're going to college, they're going for a real reason and colleges value that. And secondly, they are also very good at promoting themselves because in some sense, they've been having to promote themselves their whole life. Uh, they know how to apply for jobs. They know how to, uh, they know what their strengths are and they know how to talk about those strengths. <clears throat> and they're not afraid to look adults in the eye uh, which is a big thing in, in an interview. Yeah, that was one of one of the big things I noticed about myself when I came out of school was uh, in the work environment, it took quite a few years to deprogram the psychology of, you know, I could only socialize with people right. with one year of my age, and I was very socially awkward with people that were not quite exactly my right. age. Right, and I think that's something that happens with self-directed education is you become, at least if, if it's good self-directed education, where you're interacting with a lot of people over a large age range, you don't become intimidated by age, you don't, you become, your communication skills become very good. And that, you know, there's a lot of writing and books about how social intelligence is even more important than IQ in terms of predicting success in life. And I think that children who are growing up self-directed, who have lots of social experience with people over the whole age range, develop wonderful social intelligence <laughs> that, uh, that really carries them a long way in, in life. Oh, this has been a super inspiring conversation. I wonder if we could tie up this beautiful conversation with one last piece of wisdom. If you were to tell us what is the single most important thing to keep in mind, what would that be? Well, I think as a parent, the most important thing to keep in mind in relationship to your child is to pay attention to your child and to respect your child, pay attention to your child's needs, to be helpful to your child. Don't think that you are directing your child but you are helping your child with the child's own directions. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter Gray. Appreciate you so much. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.